So I guess we should get started at about 11.05. Um, uh, so thank you all for joining us today in our virtual community investment seminar in partnership with the Public Council, Cameo, and the law firm Morgan, Lewis, and Focus, where we will be addressing best practices on reopening your workplace during COVID-19 for California nonprofits and small business employers. I am Tiana Guerrero, Community Investment Officer for Boston Pilot in the Greater Los Angeles, and it's wonderful to have so many of our nonprofit community partners, fellow colleagues, and clients here today, and hope you're all healthy and well. I know we've all been affected by this pandemic, but our nonprofit and small business communities have been hit the hardest, so we hope that this seminar will be a great resource and tool to help guide you during this challenging time. Boston Private Community Investment Seminar Series is designed to provide pertinent and valuable information to help our nonprofit partners build capacity within their organizations. We offer these three seminars to our nonprofit community throughout the year on a variety of high impact topics. And in the past, we've had um, topics such as corporate compliance, cybersecurity, and even employment law. So we will keep you all informed of our next webinar and hope you can join us again. For those that might not be familiar with the bank, Boston Private Bank is a full-service banking and wealth management company started in 1986 in Boston, Massachusetts, our corporate headquarters, and we entered the California market in 2001 and currently serve clients from our offices located in the major markets of Greater Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, Miami, and Palm Beach Gardens. At Boston Private, we are committed to serving the needs of our entire community, investing in low and moderate people in neighborhoods as part of our business strategy and conviction. That's why we take the time to establish close partnerships with groups who work in the community and are involved in their development each day. We want to understand their needs, their whys, and how we can help them attain their goals. We have provided financing solutions for the creation and preservation of affordable housing, first-time home buyers, economic development, and social service initiatives in our underserved areas of our community. Our commitment to the community has earned the bank an outstanding CRA rating by the FDIC and FRB for the past 15 years, and since 2000, we have given over $1.5 billion towards our community investment initiatives in all our targeted communities in lending and investment. <laughs> Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce our agenda and speaker for today's webinar. We will be discussing best practices on getting your workforce back to work safely, presented by attorney Melinda Riker and Jennifer Zargroff from Morgan Lewis and Bokia. Topics discussed, there's the agenda. Topics discussed will include policies, procedures, and training best practices, such as workplace screening, social distancing, PPE and sanitization. Um, they'll also go over high-risk employees and accommodations, how to manage non-employee populations, um, and COVID-19 monitoring. Um, uh, some, uh, a little bit about our um, incredible speakers. Melinda Riker is a partner at Morgan Focus. She has experience litigating and arbitrating both class actions and single plaintiff cases. Melinda defends clients in wage and hour, whistleblower, wrongful termination, discrimination, harassment, retaliation, breach of contract, trade secrets, and all other types of employment disputes. Melinda has won verdicts for her clients in six jury trials and four bench trials, and she has won numerous summary judgments and arbitration awards. Jennifer advocates for employers in a broad range of employment-related disputes with a focus on class actions and multi-plaintiff litigation. She serves as defense counsel in wrongful termination, discrimination, retaliation, wage and hour, fair credit reporting, and other varied employment-related matters. Uh, she also counsels clients on myriad labor and employment issues, including personnel policies and procedures, employee discipline matters, and employment contracts. Jennifer practices across several industries, including retail, healthcare, transportation, financial services, media, and technology. So now I'll pass over the mic to our community partner, Heidi Pickman from Cameo, who will provide her introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you. My name is Heidi Pickman. I am the Vice President of Programs and Policy for Cameo. 
For those of you I think, who don't know who we are, we're a statewide network of entrepreneurial training programs and micro lenders in the state of California, and we're starting to get some membership abroad um, in other states. Uh, we do capacity building for our members, which is why we partnered with Public Council, Boston Friday, and Morgan Lewis, so thanks everybody for the partnership. Um, we also do advocacy on behalf of small businesses as well as our members. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our network, um, you might have heard of the PPP program and small business development um, centers and women's business centers, who I think there's a couple of you on the on the call of names that I recognize. Um, if you want to um, go ahead and type your name into chat, what organization you're, at, you're in, that would be great. Um, be good to see um, what everybody knows is on the call. Um, with that, um, I, know, I know we have a lot to go through, and I want to thank Melinda um, and Jennifer and Annie and turn it back to you, Anna. Okay. <laughs> Oh, so I'm going to introduce now Annie Market from Public Council. <laughs> Thanks, Ayana. So I am a staff attorney at Public Council. For those of you who are not familiar with Public Council, we provide free legal services to people struggling with poverty in L.A. County across a wide variety of areas, immigration, uh, homelessness prevention, impact litigation, children's rights, a veteran's assistance. And I am personally a lawyer in the community development project. The mission of the Community Development Project is to improve the lives of uh, people living in low-income communities and communities of color and so less. We do that in a number of different ways. But what's relevant for us all today is that we provide free non-litigation legal services to uh, non-profits that help low-income people in L.A. County, as well as to low-income micro-entrepreneurs. And by non-litigation, it really is a very wide gamut. We do choice of entity. We easily advise on incorporation, applying for tax exempt status, employment law advice, um, intellectual property, reviewing contracts, reviewing leases. As long as your nonprofit helps low-income people in L.A. County, you would qualify for our services. And we provide these services both with our, with our in-house attorneys as well as a network of literally thousands of attorneys across the city, state, and county. And one of our um, most active pro bono partners is Morgan Lewis. They've taken on many, many uh, pro bono matters for us over the last several years. And we also have, we do these ongoing trainings. Um, we do four a year with Boston Private, and we have other ones periodically. We also have plenty of uh, free um, resources on our website uh, relevant to small businesses and nonprofits that are available to all. Um, I can't think of that all type in our website into the chat, and you can also um, choose a tab that says a tab that says community development project, and then you'll see our resources. And I think I can hand it over to Melinda now. Thank you, Melinda. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, we'll get to the first slide, which I think is a legal disclaimer. No, we're going to go to the current landscape. So I, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, the great thing about being, uh, and you can tell, uh, and you can perhaps from my accent that I'm from England, and the good thing about England is that the laws are pretty much whatever the central government passes. But in the great United States of America, we're subject to many, many laws, uh, and they are not always the same. So if we can get to the I think, third slide. Here's the legal disclaimer, and after that. So we're all subject to federal law, uh, as well as state law, as well as county law, as well as city law. And as I mentioned, not all of these laws are consistent with each other. Uh, people of, I'm from Northern California, from the uh, San Francisco Peninsula. And people often ask me, should I set up my organization or my company in San Francisco? And the answer to that is no, uh, because San Francisco has more pro-employee laws uh, than any other city that I know of that applies to people who work in San Francisco. And while these laws are very good for the employees, they make it exceptionally hard for the employer to comply with all of the different laws, to know about and comply with all the different laws. And in this pandemic, we have found that there are many uh, cities and states 
states and counties that come up with different laws. Uh, and so you have to really look at the ordinances in the cities and the states and the counties in which you have employees. For example, San Jose, uh, Northern California, has its own ordinances. And if you have employees in San Jose, then you have to comply with those ordinances. San Jose is part of Santa Clara County. And if you're in San Jose, you're also in Santa Clara County, so you have to comply with Santa Clara County's ordinance. And of course, both are in the state of California, so you have to comply with the state of California's ordinance. And these ordinances are changing all the time, and particularly in the early months of the pandemic, months of the pandemic they were constantly changing. And we ended up having a team of, I think, 70 associates that were trying to track all these laws in 4,000 jurisdictions in the United States to keep up to date on them. Uh, it seems to have settled down a little bit now, but as reopening starts up, I think we're going to find these states and the counties and the cities have their own ideas. Uh, they often require you to uh, publish a notice to your employees and post it around the place. They're not always the same. So please look at the local ordinances for your city, for your county, as well as the state of California, and then, of course, all the federal rules, um, mostly the CDC, but there are other rules that we have to follow as well. And that's the best way to keep up to speed is follow them often and uh, read them and try to understand them. Next slide. So now we're going to talk about um, if you are going to get people back into the workplace, what are the best ways to go about this, to go about doing that. Next slide. So one of the questions, and I think uh, advising clients and clients since March on COVID issues, as has Jennifer and, and many of the other hundreds of employment lawyers we have at Morgan Lewis, have been trying to advise clients, first of all, uh, a lot of it on layoffs and and now trying to get people back into the office. Um, here in Northern California, as you may have read, most of our tech clients are not bringing people back into the office and have committed not to do so for either a year or forever. But other organizations and companies are starting to talk about bringing people back into the office once the state and the county and the city allow them to do so. So I think this is an excellent time for everybody, fun time for everybody to be coming up with a plan on how you're going to do this. And one of the things that we look at is, you know, who wants to come back to the office and who doesn't want to come back to the office. And it may be that you have some people you just really need to come back and whether they want to come back or not is not, an, is, is not something that they can choose. But to the extent that you have people who have been working well from home who can continue to work well from home uh, and who want to work from home, then you certainly can ask the volunteers to come back into the office or volunteers to stay working from home. And if you want, you can uh, let people volunteer and do what they want to do. The second issue that we see is that some people, it's really hard to work from home. I am the mother of two daughters, and uh, my two daughters have two daughters under five. So it's four granddaughters, but they are working full time and trying to deal with two young girls at home. And so for them, I think they would be delighted to go back to the office. Fortunately, they have a nanny now that is allowed to come back and go back to the home. And there are other people who work in, um, who live in apartments with lots of other people, and for them, working at home is really difficult. Maybe they don't have a setup at home. So for some people, it may be better for them to come into the office. Uh, some jobs are better done in the office. So that's another, so that's another thing for you to think about as you're deciding who to bring back, you know, which people have been working well remotely, which people haven't been working well remotely, uh, and then factoring that in the decision as to who should return. Almost all of our clients are doing either staggered work schedules or only having a percentage of the employees return. So with the staggered work schedules, uh, many, many of our manufacturing plants, for example, who have been essential workers, tech industry up here is largely essential, um, have been having an A group and a B group and a C group. And the A group only ever kind of comes to work with the A group and never meets the B and the C group. And there's a period of time between the time that A starts and, and B starts and then the C starts. So 
that the employees don't mingle with each other. So if there is an outbreak with the A group, then at least the B group and the C group are protected. So I don't know to what extent your organizations can provide with a staggered schedule. Some people have um, employees that come in on Monday and Wednesday and Friday, and then the next they go back to the class slide, and then not Tuesday, Wednesday, and or Tuesday and, or Tuesday and Thursday. So there's various ways that you can uh, organize this to try to have either staggered, staggered schedule or have only a percentage of your employees return. Like um, any of our clients are having 25% of the people come back in the first week and then waiting three weeks, see how that works, and then having maybe another 25% or 10% come in, and then another 25 or 10% until they gradually get it um, up to the requirements, the requirements that they need or the maximum number they're going to have. But again, you've got to look at the local ordinances because they have limits on the number of people you can bring back and the percentage, as well as the state. Next slide. So once you've figured who's coming back and how many people are coming back, uh, we have to talk about how to keep those employees back. And when I'm talking about talking employees, I'm also talking about volunteers here. They should be treated as employees with respect to these issues of bringing them back to work or bringing them back into the organization to help us. So just about all of our clients um, are providing, uh, are requiring screenings, regular screenings, and the laws are generally requiring regular screenings. And so these screenings are, remember what we started the very pan pandemic with, which is, you know, have you been in close proximity to anyone who's had, who you know, and they have COVID within the last 14 days, tested positive for COVID in the last 14 days, have you experienced any symptoms in the last 14 days? And again, there are several ways you can do this. You can either have a, a, a notice in the front door of the building, which some of our clients are doing, and it has these questions on them. And then it's either requiring employees to click a map or to send a text or to fill out a notice or a form or something that there is something that specifies that they have, uh, they can pass the screening and they haven't been in close contact or had the symptoms or had the test. But that's the sort of the, the sort of minimum that you need to do is have people certify or state that they can meet that personal screening. And then the other things we're going to talk about are things that some companies and organizations are adopting and uh, some are not. Uh, generally, they're not mandatory, but again, look at the local ordinance or the state or city or the county. Uh, we're going to talk about temperature screens and other types of testing, um, what kind of screening is permitted under the Americans with Disabilities Act and state and local laws. We're going to talk about whether you have to pay people for screening time. Uh, one of the uh, most difficult challenges for our uh, employers in California is complying with our wage and hour laws. As many of you may know, we have um, all wage and hour laws in California here than anywhere else. I think it's 900 pages in the labor code. And trying to keep up with that and paying people correctly is very, very difficult for our California employers. And um, whether you have to pay people for screening and testing at the same time is another issue that uh, you then have to deal with. Um, you should be training your personnel on how to conduct these screenings, and then you've got to maintain um, private information, confidential and private, throughout the, throughout the screening and testing. So the next slides we're going to do with those other considerations. Let's go to the next slide on temperature check. And by the way, before the pandemic, uh, we were telling people you cannot temperature check your employees. Generally, the Americans with Disabilities Act and California law put it's you from doing medical tests uh, on your employees, but employees, uh, uh, because we're now in a pandemic, um, they changed all those rules. So uh, these with respect to te temperature checks, you are allowed to do this, and uh, many clients are doing them. Uh, when you do temperature checks, be sure to temperature check everybody. Don't pick and choose who you temperature check, because that can always create issues. And then you need to have a standard criterion on what's going to happen if the temperature check needs a certain number. The general number that the CDC uses is 100.4 centigrade uh, fever. Uh, if somebody is higher than somebody is higher than that, then they want the test, and if someone's lower than that, they pass the test. Uh, so um, that's generally the standard that we use, and just make sure it's, uh, everybody's treated the same. Uh, of 
course, when you're doing a temperature check, you've got to maintain the same social distancing that you're going to have to do for everything else, so six feet apart. Uh, we recommend using a non-contact temporal infrared thermometer. You've seen those, those little gun that they point at your forehead uh, and it takes your temperature. Uh, something where people can do it from a distance and there's no contact and obviously no reuse of any of the um, thermometers that you're using. Uh, and the question then becomes, who's going to do these temperature checks? Uh, are you going to have the employees do them themselves? Are you going to have a medical provider do them? And generally, nobody can afford or can even find a medical provider to do them. Uh, so I don't know of any companies that are using medical personnel uh, to do temperature checks. Um, my clients seem to be doing it in two different ways, uh, either having uh, employees do their own temperature checks at home in the morning. So they don't come in, so they don't turn into work. Uh, they take their temperature just before they come into work. If they're less than 104 degrees, then they come into work. Uh, you can have your employees verify that they've taken their temperature check. If you don't trust them, they can send you a text or an email that says, hey, my temperature was less than 104 today. Or you can just trust them and assume that they're going to not come into work if they have a fever, but you certainly can mandate that your employees take their own temperatures in the morning uh, before they come to work. Or many of our clients, people clients, they are big manufacturing clients. Maybe for those of you who have a lot of people in the building, uh, volunteers and others, uh, maybe doing a food bank or something like that, but also a lot of members of the public coming in, uh, maybe you actually want to temperature check everybody, the volunteers, the employees, and the people who are coming in uh, to get services from you. And again, the, the temperature down would be a good way to do that. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's idea, more ideal if you can do it in a private setting, but uh, I don't know that that's practical, practicable for many of our clients. And so they just are uh, screening people with the temperature uh, thermometer as they come into work. Uh, obviously, the person who's doing the screening Better if that person has the proper PPE, the mask, and the gloves, and maybe even a gown, maybe even a plastic shield. I know these things are hard to come by, but uh, that person who's doing the temperature checks, the temperature checks, everybody is going to be exposed to a lot of people. So we want that person to be as protected as possible. So those are really the ways that we talk about doing temperature checks, of so having people do their own in the morning. Even I guess they could do it um, in the car. Uh, but it would make most sense to do it in the morning when, before they come in, or you check everybody as they come in, and making sure that they are under So another question that I'm getting a lot of times is, can I make people uh, get COVID testing? Uh, so can I say to my employees, you cannot come to work, or my volunteers or anybody, you can't come to work unless you give me a piece of paper that says you've been tested for COVID. And my strong advice to my clients is don't bother to do this. I'm not saying that it's illegal to do it, but first of all, it's very expensive. These tests are expensive, tests are expensive and if you're going to require it of your employees, you're going to have to pay for it. Uh, secondly, um, they're very hard to get still, and the results are still being significantly delayed. I'm hearing people five or ten days um, on to, to get the test results. And so, obviously, if you, you know, require your employee to take a test and, and you have to wait five or ten days before you get the result, it's not terribly valuable to have had the test result. Because, after all, the test only tests the individual at that moment. So, if I get a COVID test today, uh, and five days later, it tells me that five days ago you didn't have COVID, that really isn't very valuable for anybody. And so that's why I just am not recommending uh, to do the COVID test. If you do insist on COVID tests, uh, that's not something you can do on your own. You've got to have a healthcare professional. As those of you who have seen the television, uh, they stick a swab way up your nose, and it's very unpleasant. So uh, something, that's something that should only be done by a healthcare professional. Uh, of course, you know, the employees can go to a lab, they could do the test themselves if they want to, uh, that's all fine. Um, but also, even if you do require the test, not only do you have to wait a long time, but they're, they're not terribly, they're not completely accurate. So you may get false negatives, 
So therefore, even the testing doesn't guarantee that somebody doesn't have COVID. So it's for all of those reasons that uh, I recommend against uh, organizations requiring COVID testing for their employees, volunteers, or anybody. Monda, before we leave the testing topic, we're seeing some questions in the chat about if you are going to require a test, who pays for it? Should the employer pay for it? Is it covered by the employee's insurance? How should that work? In California, we don't require to do something. And this is not applicants. This is employees. This is employees. An employee a job. You should be paying for it. And so my advice to clients is if you insist on the test, then employer will pay it. And your employees will have health insurance. And you certainly can submit the test to health insurance, and the health insurance will pay. Um, and I think most health insurance companies are required to pay for the COVID testing now. But there may be deductibles or co-pays or other things that your employees um, are required to uh, pay. And my view is that you should um, pay for that. We got a question this morning, I think, uh, from one of our colleagues in our firm about what about pre-employment COVID testing? So somebody is an applicant for an employee, can you require that they get a COVID test for that, and then do you have to pay for it? And uh, again, I strongly recommend, I strongly recommend against um, requiring the COVID test because I just don't think that it tells you anything meaningful. Um, but uh, you may not have to pay for it. It may be a different situation. Um, I don't know if you've been advising clients, Jennifer, on pre on applicant uh, medical testing of whatever the organization has to pay for that. I, d I don't think the, <laughs> you know, you always look at the cost and benefits and the additional hurdles and risks that are created by requiring testing versus the limited information you get from it and the limited reliability of the information you get from it just doesn't balance out. There may be unique situations, you know, where someone is, you know, in a healthcare setting where you're dealing with vulnerable folks or something where the answer might be different. But for a typical employer, office workers, warehouse workers and the like, I don't think it makes sense either. Yeah, I have um, clients whose employees are taking advantage of this pandemic and not coming to work and saying that they are, uh, they, are they have symptoms of COVID. And those employers would like to require their employees to get tested to prove that they do, in fact, have the, have, have COVID uh, or requiring them to come back to them to come back to work. Again, I'm recommending strongly against that, but it would not be illegal for you to require that your employee uh, who wants to stay off work to get a test. But again, it's going to take a while to get the test results, and if the test comes back uh, negative, then the employee comes back to work, to work, but they may get symptoms again the next day, and then you'll be back to square one. Any other questions on testing? Why don't we go on to the next slide? And we are going to take a break and break and come back and pick up any questions that haven't been answered. Uh, but please feel free to be sending your questions to the chat box and Jennifer's monitoring them. And we'll try to answer them as we go along or we'll answer them um, just before we take a, a brief stop at the end of the section. So what happens if you say to your employee, say to your employee, hey, you can't come to work unless you take a COVID test, and the employee says, well, I'm not taking a COVID test, so what are you going to do about it? Um, you are permitted to prevent your employees from coming to work. Um, if they don't, you tell them they have to take a test and they don't take a test. So it, it is a it is permissible to require to require testing, and it's permissible to require that your employees take the test or not come to work. Uh, so that is perfectly allowed. Um, we actually don't recommend terminating or disciplining employees who are employees who refuse to take the test. Uh, we just think that that would be a harsh thing. But sending them home without pay uh, is certainly permissible uh, until the crisis passes. And so while we're still in the pandemic. You can require them to take the test. If they refuse to take the test, then uh, you can send them home without pay. Now, all of these rules I'm telling you about testing 
have this major exception of people who have a disability or religious-based exception. So remember, in, uh, under the law in California, you cannot discriminate against people based on lots of protected characteristics, age, gender, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and, and many, 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 many other uh, characteristics, about 40 of them. But three groups of people are entitled to special protection, uh, and that is pregnant people, disabled people, and people with uh, religious beliefs. And those people, not only can you not discriminate against them, but you must accommodate them, meaning you have to treat them better than everybody else. Discrimination meaning you can't treat them worse than anybody else. These three groups of people you have to treat better than others. So if other people uh, don't want to come to work uh, on Saturday, they have to come to work on Saturday, too bad, or Sunday. But if you have a religious objection, then the employer uh, has to accommodate that religion if it can without undue hardship. So there are, are people with disabilities who will or may tell you that they cannot take a COVID test. And if so, you must accommodate that if you can. And this is a very tricky issue, any issue, and you should definitely consult with counsel uh, before doing this. Because I think some of the most difficult areas of the law are the areas of accommodating disabled and religious and pregnant employees. So um, my, one of my favorite cases on this subject was um, about the, uh, an employee of, of Kaiser, and that employee um, was a vegan. And Kaiser required that all of its employees um, take, take various vaccinations or inoculations or shots before they could work there. And this employee said, well, I can't do that because these um, shots are incubated in eggs, and I'm a vegan, and so I cannot take a shot with eggs. And Kaiser says, that's fine, but then you can't work here. So the employee sued for religious discrimination, claiming that veganism was a religion. And even in California, the Court of Appeals said that veganism is not a religion. And so Kaiser was free to uh, not, uh, uh, not accommodate him, date him, and it could require that he take the shots before coming to work there. One of my other favorite cases on this issue involved Costco, and there was an employee who had tattoos and body piercings all over their body. And Costco said, well, that's fine. You can have all of those, but you have to cover them up when you come to work at Costco. And the employee says, no, no, I'm a member of the church of, the relig of, the church of body piercings and tattoos. And my religion requires that I show my body piercings and tattoos at this time. And the courts don't like to really get into whether something is a detailed religious belief, belief. But in that case, the court said that Costco had a legitimate business reason to require the employee to cover their tattoos and uh, get things uh, when they came. But just remember, disability, religion, pregnancy, those are all entitled to super protection. Which if somebody says they can't take a test, uh, because of some belief, uh, you should get counsel and decide if you can accommodate whether it would impose an undue hardship. And, of course, an undue hardship would be the piece that everybody else is taking tests, and now you want to come to work and be paid, come to volunteer, and you don't want to take the test, and you might therefore be infected with everybody else. And, and a test would also include the uh, thermometers or the temperature checks. So you would have to decide whether you can decide whether you can pass some hardship uh, to everybody else if that employee can come to work without having been. There are no questions on that issue. So soon we will be getting antibody testing. Uh, it's not really out yet, and it's not really good yet. But the I and I would actually have to, love to have the half this test. Not that I think I've had COVID because I haven't been anywhere or done anything. But wouldn't it be great to be able to take a test that says, hey, I have, ha I have had COVID and I cannot get it again, assuming that turns out to be true. And I can go anywhere and do anything and don't worry about me. And wouldn't it be nice if you knew if your employees or your volunteers had the antibodies to COVID? You could do a lot of things for them that you couldn't do with other people. So I think there are, there's definitely going to be a desire by employers and employers to find out if their employees have the antibodies to COVID, and assuming that means they can't get it again. Um, but 
right now you can't test people for uh, antibodies. Uh, it's just not allowed. Uh, it doesn't test for whether they're currently sick. It just tests for whether they have had COVID in the past. And the EEOC has specifically said you cannot require EEOC, uh, antibody testing to make decisions about it. So please don't think about antibody testing. Now, this can all change. As I said, temperature checks weren't allowed, and now they're allowed. So, uh, COVID tests weren't allowed, and now they're allowed. So it may be that at some point we are allowed to do antibody testing. But since they don't test whether the employee is currently sick, uh, only whether they were sick in the past, uh, I think it's not likely that employees then will allow antibody testing. Which doesn't mean employees can't do it voluntarily. You just can't. So California uh, has a constitutional right of privacy. As far as I know, the only state where it's written into the Constitution that all employees, including employees of private companies and organizations, have a constitutional right of privacy. And if you violate that right of privacy, right of privacy, then you can get sued. We have a tort called an invasion of privacy tort. We have statutes that deal with it. Um, I don't know if you've all up to speed. I hope you are on the CCPA, which is the new California statute like the GDPR in Europe that has lots of requirements for um, protecting uh, information that organizations collect on their uh, employees and others. And um, these are some new regulations that came out in July with limited requirements right now for employers, but you do have to post a notice that says what it says types of information you collect on your employees. So if you are not a CCPA expert and haven't looked at that, um, make sure you comply with the CCPA for your employees. But um, most of the requirements of the CCPA do not apply to employees yet, but they will in the future. But the Americans with Disabilities Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, which covers everybody in the United States, the United States, medical examiners are must be treated as confidential. You cannot put them in the employee's personnel file. So you have to keep two separate files, a personnel file and a medical file. So the medical file must be locked up. Uh, if you have actual paper files anymore, uh, you have to put them in a the file cabinet and lock the file cabinet and preferably lock the room that has the file cabinet. Uh, and uh, if you have them in, uh, online somewhere, then uh, you've got to make sure it's all password protected and people can't get access to it. So just remember, medical records, super secret. And of course, that would include the results of COVID tests, the results of temperature checks, all of those things are medical records. And so you cannot uh, disclose those and you have to keep them confidential. So obviously, we've been getting a lot of questions and more so recently of what happens if I have an employee who tests positive. So yesterday, I had a client call and their cleaning person, the person who cleans their building who's not an employee but a contractor, that person tested positive. So what do I do? I have an employee who tests positive, or a contractor, or a visitor, or a volunteer, or uh, some, one of the people that you're helping out tests positive. What do I do? One thing you, we know you cannot do is tell people the name of that employee. So while that seems, that seems counterintuitive to non-employment lawyers, it is the law. So you cannot say, hey, everybody, Joan, Joan Brown, tested positive for COVID yesterday, so if you were in contact with Joan Brown, you better watch out because you might get it too. Uh, that is not allowed. not allowed. What you can say is not using the employee's name. You could say an employee in Building 3 or an employee on the second floor or an employee who was in, at work on this day has tested positive, uh, and you may therefore have been exposed to someone who tested positive for the virus not entirely clear what you're supposed to do, but this client I had yesterday who had the cleaning person who tested positive, they wrote an email to everybody who had been in that building on the two days before the place, before the person, on the two days before the person was, the cleaning person was last in the building. So the cleaning person was in the building on the 14th of August. They sent an email to everybody who was in the building the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th. And they knew that because they had badging records. So badging records are good. You have to go back to the badging records, see who was in the building, see if you can find out who was 
close to or could have been close to the person who was exposed, exposed or uh, who had the virus, and then you notify all those people without giving a name that they may have been exposed uh, to the virus. And uh, as I say, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do with it, but whatever you do, don't tell the name. Any questions on that? No, we'll go to the next topic. I um, think we had one question. Um, what about the people who have been off this building and are not in the same company? Is the landlord obligated to have to know? So all of these are questions that I wish we knew the answer to. I, I think for most of our high-rise buildings, the hardest thing is going to be the elevators. And what are we going to do about the elevators? Uh, because uh, because you know, they can only hold so many people. Uh, and how you, you get four people on an elevator or two people on an elevator, I, I don't know what they're going to do with those high rise. Um, um, I don't know if a landlord is obligated to advise you. Uh, as opposed to the moral obligation and the legal obligation. I would think that if somebody told the landlord that somebody in the building who used the elevator was, has tested positive, I would think a landlord may well send out a notice to all the tenants of the building and say, on August the 14th, um, an employee who used elevator number three uh, or someone who used elevator number three in the building has tested positive. And as a result, uh, they want to be back. Uh, I don't know that it's a legal obligation. People often ask us, do we as employers have legal obligations to tell the health department if somebody has tested positive? And the answer generally is no. Uh, that's the obligation of the health care provider, uh, not the employer. But I still recommend and did recommend in the early days of post department, if only to get help on what you should do. Uh, because um, employers were just really um, at a lot when someone tested. And if say I called the health department and then they told me I should, and that's exactly So we give some protection to the employers. But we do not believe there's a legal obligation on the employer to notify the health department if someone tested. Melinda, we also have a question on if there is a COVID positive employee, um, does the employer need to shut down that location uh, and for how long or can cleaning and sanitation efforts be enough? So all good questions and I don't, there's no legal obligation to close it down. So much of this is going to depend on your own comfort level, the comfort level of your employees. Uh, you know, if you don't shut down the facility, first of all, cleaning is absolutely essential. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in the next section. But, uh, you know, it, will your employees continue to come to work if you notify them, hey, somebody tested positive in the building, um, uh, the building's still open, but we've cleaned it, and we've done this and that and the other, done as much as they can. Some, some organizations are going to say, my employees are not going to want to come to work in that situation. Uh, some employers are just going to say, you know, we've cleaned it, we've done everything we can, um, and, you know, we would really like you to come back to work. Again, it, it depends in part on how much the employee has to come into the office to work. They can work from home, and why not let them continue to do so? But as the number of cases increases, right, we're going to see a lot more of people testing positive than we already are, and you'll just have to decide. Um, what your organization is going to do if someone does such a problem. But, you know, if, if it is going to become as prevalent as, as it seems to be, then I'm concerned that if you close down for 14 days the whole building, every time somebody tests positive, you're just never going to open. There was one more question. It says, if an employee who is COVID positive consented to share their name, would the employer be able to do this? I mean, they can waive their right of privacy, so I think that um, it's a right that's waivable. So I guess if the employee said, please tell everybody that I tested positive, uh, I would like to get it in writing because I'm a cautious lawyer and I always like everything in writing. Uh, and it can be an email. When I say in writing, it doesn't have to be a, an agreement or anything like that. It can be, thanks for letting us know. 
um, you, you've advised us that you um, would like us to tell everybody or tell people, but give people your name. I always worry that the employee will say that they were pressured by the employer. So if the employer says, hey, is it okay if we give your name to everybody, the employee may feel pressured to say yes. And then that's not a voluntary waiver of their right of privacy. But if the employee is the first person that says, hey, I just tested positive and I want you to tell everybody that I've tested positive and give them my name and here are the people I've been in contact with, then you could do it. Um, but again, you don't really need to, to do it. You don't really need to say the name of the person. You just need to say, find out who they were in contact with by asking them or checking back records or any other way and then notifying those people. So the name is not important to me. The good thing is that the same answer I gave in the chat. <laughs> Whenever you have a wa waiver situation, you know, those employee tell whomever they want, but, um, you know, if one, once the cat's out of the bag, if the employee regrets it, um, you know, who's going to be blamed, right? The employer saying, oh, I didn't know I didn't have to tell, or, you know, you made me feel pressured, or whatever. So um, there's really no benefit to the employer to be the one to share. Um, certainly, if you have it in writing, you're in better stead than just relying on a, you know, an oral okay. Uh, but if the employee wants to share, you know, they can do it. And in, in many offices, uh, as some I think have pointed out in the chat, it'll be obvious. A small group people will know. Um, but there's a big difference between, you know, people figuring it out versus, you know, risking a, a privacy violation. And we are seeing some of those claims. So it's not just a theoretical risk. Right, and uh, it's it's a similar situation if an employee has cancer or some other illness. Um, I've had situations where the employee, other employees, the coworkers of the employee, go to the manager and say, "Hey, so and so is looking really thin, or so and so is looking really sick, or so and so hasn't been coming to work. Is he okay? What can I do? How can I help?" And in that situation, I tell the manager, "You cannot tell the employee, other employees, what's wrong with the person." Even though they want to know for good, nice, kind, personal reasons, you have to say, I'm sorry, I can't discuss employee health information. Of course, the coworkers are entitled to go to the employee and ask the employee, and the employee can answer if they want. I don't encourage that because I do think that medical information is private, and people shouldn't feel compelled or uh, to, to reveal that information. I, I always give, tell the managers when I do manager training, I say, if the answer is HIV or AIDS, do you really want to know? So don't be, you know, see someone who's getting really thin and looks really sick. You don't need to know what's wrong with them. You need to know, can I help? Can I uh, cover any of your clients? Can I um, do any of your work? Can I send you some food? What can I do to help? Uh, that's all fine, but you don't need to know what's wrong with people. So don't ask, don't tell. And the same is talk of it. We also got a question about if, if someone is test positive and one of the, you know, steps you're going to take is to clean the work environment, so how long does that take? And I, I think there's no magic answer to that, and you may have seen how folks have approached it. I think vendors will tell you, um, you know, what they recommend. Obviously, they tend to recommend us, right, if that's how they charge, um, but we'll let you know whether there's certain chemicals that it's better to have that, you know, some ventilation after that cleaning has been done, things like that. And I think it depends on the context, too, of what type of employee we're talking about. You know, were they just in their sort of secluded office and a few common areas, but not really, versus, you know, maybe someone who's delivering the mail and was in everyone's office, touching everyone's doors, et cetera. Right. I know the CDC has some guidelines on cleaning offices, so you should look at that. But I've had clients that have got quotes of thousands of dollars to clean an office, particularly after someone had COVID. And so... You know, you, you've got to be reasonable. You can't spend five thousand dollars every time someone gets COVID from the offices. So I agree with Jennifer. You know, clean as much as needs to be clean. Follow the CDC guidelines. Well, lots of companies getting into this business now, and most of your uh, cleaning people in the buildings have been trained and should be trained on this. You should make sure that people are using the right procedures and doing extra cleaning and extra cleaning. All right, if there are no more questions, we can go to the next slide.
So again, you could bring people back into the office, maybe a few at a time, maybe a few days at a time, maybe in different groups at a time. Um, what are we going to do? The first thing is you're going to check the city, the county, the state, uh, occupancy limits to make sure how many people. I think some of the counties were requiring 25% maximum, um, but you need to check and make sure how many you can bring back. And then uh, anybody who's been out of their house knows we have to keep six feet apart. Uh, many organizations are drawing six-foot circles around their uh, workstations so that know what six feet is and know not to cross that boundary when they talk to people. Uh, anything that you can do to um, let people know what that six foot is is always helpful. I know I've seen little footprints out in front of buildings and uh, Safeway has them and you have to stand on their little footprints and you can't get to the next footprint until the one until it's been vacated. So those are all uh, good things to do. Uh, face coverings. I never thought face coverings would become a political issue. It's just astounding to me how resistant on political grounds or whatever people are to using uh, face coverings. And this has become a huge problem for a lot of our retail clients because the customer comes in and they refuse to wear a face covering. And who is supposed to deal with that? Is it the employee who's serving the customer? Is it the manager of the building? Uh, I've seen fights, uh, fights over whether people should wear face coverings or not. Uh, generally, we don't like our employees to have to be involved in these issues. Uh, we certainly don't like our employees to be involved if it's um, going to be contentious. If you have to get someone involved, managers are better than our managers for doing that. But, you know, put out signs, ask people to wear face coverings. Um, if you can, in a polite way, tell customers and visitors that they have to wear them, then that would be good. Uh, you can mandate that your employees wear them, and if they don't, just send them home. It's just like clothes, right? You have to wear clothes to work, and if they don't wear clothes or they don't wear the uniform, then you send them home. Send them home if they don't have the face. Um, and they have okay, to wear like them. that. Yeah, they have to be dressed. Yeah, much like that. Before, <laughs> top and bottom. Uh, so before we leave masks, um, we're getting some uh, questions on um, do employers need to provide them, and uh, if so, how many? Um, and so uh, I wonder if you'll address that, Melinda, and I'm happy to chime in on it well, as well. Yeah, it comes up in the next slide, but let's talk about it now. So California has this great statute called 2802 of the Labor Code, and 2802 requires that employers cover reasonable and necessary expenses. And, for example, if you have a uniform, then you, the employer must pay for the uniform. But if the uniform is a plaid shirt and a plaid and, and brown pants, then that's not a uniform because they can wear it outside of work. So we've been having lots of debates with our clients about whether they actually have to provide masks and pay for them. Um, my view is, let's do it. Don't, you don't want a lawsuit about whether you should have provided a mask and you should have paid for the mask and you should have paid for the cleaning of the mask. Uh, so if you can find masks, uh, uh, get them, provide them, pay for them, and, and even disposable ones are going to be better because um, there's a question about who has to clean them. So uh, employees, uh, once they take the mask off, you know, should they put a new fresh mask on? Do you need three a day? Do you need because you have to take them off to eat. I don't know what the number is, but uh, if you can find these relatively inexpensive blue paperish masks and just put boxes in them everywhere, that would be good. Jennifer, you're thinking on masks? Yeah, a lot the same. I mean, I think the uniform analogy is a good one. Um, you know, when employers provide uniforms, generally, as long as they can just be washed in the washing machine, you don't have to you know, pay for cleaning or anything like that. So I think it's good for employees to have, you know, if you're going to provide masks, to have, you know, if you can provide five so someone can get through a week, I think that's good. Um, so so many people are wearing masks for lots of things now, not just for going to work, right? You need it at the grocery store and most other public places. So it hasn't been as big of an issue as we expected or as, or as it was initially because so many people have their own 
masks that have, you know, their sports team on it and all, all sorts of things like that. Um, but practically speaking, most employers, especially ones with public-facing employees like retailers and others where they're having people, um, having to come in contact with people who are not close contact, um, have just purchased, you know, box and boxes and boxes of those, um, uh, not the N95, but those basic disposable masks. And, um, and I think it's, you know, worth the expense, if you can, um, to have, have something, um, because I do think it could become a, an expense issue and people forget it or they can, you know, drop it and it gets dirty, uh, things like that. Um, as I said, most people have masks these days, so it hasn't been as big of an issue as we, as we wondered, uh, that it might be. Um, I think there's a couple of related questions. So there's no magic number. I think it would be great if you could get someone through the week um, with either disposable or cloth masks. Um, and someone has also said, you know, if someone doesn't wear a mask, do we discipline or send home? If it is as simple as, hey, you're not wearing your mask, put it on, and they say, oh, I just got back from break, sorry, I put it on, um, and and that's all there is, that just seems like an easy reminder. If it's a repeated problem where it's clear that the person is it's a performance issue, then you deal with it like a performance issue. Certainly, if someone refuses to wear a mask, I would send them home and not allow them to return unless they agree to wear one. All right, and and of course, you know, the mask has, has the virus in it. If you if you have the virus and you're breathing in your mask, and you take your mask off and you put it down on the counter, then you have just put a virus. Load, as one of our partners called it, a virus load. Uh, so you need to, you know, make sure employees are properly disposing on it. Uh, if you can give them three a day, that would be great, um, so that they can uh, uh, take one off when they take their lunch. I put one in the morning and maybe one to pick a snack and then one at their lunch and then throw them away and obviously provide places where they can throw them away uh, so that um, they uh, don't spread the virus around. Any other mask questions? So I agree. If they if they refuse to wear a mask, if they don't, then you send them home. If they don't have a mask, you can send them home. But it's much better if you provide them for them. Uh, so and you can mandate it. All right. Separate separate desks and workstations. Um, this is not always easy, and we often have small spaces where we work in, particularly for not profit, non profits. We don't have these huge areas. But and even our tech clients, you know, they all have open areas where employees are right next to each other. To the extent that you can have people uh, not next to each other and separate them out, that would be a good thing to do. Particularly if you only got 25% of your people back at work, then there's no reason for people to be sitting right next to each other. Uh, have them in the alternate places. And I know one company, companies that have done really well in this pandemic are plexiglass companies. Uh, I just saw an article, an interview with a plexiglass manufacturer, and he's been working 24-7 uh, since the virus making plexiglass. So to the extent you can get that and put it up and separate the workstations, those are all good. Uh, any kind of partitions that you can add uh, when you have open floor plans. Uh, that would be great. And as I say, stagger the, the desk or the workstations so that people are not sitting next to each other. Uh, conference rooms and break rooms are a problem. Some of our clients are not allowing employees to use break rooms or cafeterias. They close their cafeterias. Uh, they're not letting people go into common areas like that. And even if employees are in the office, many of our clients are requiring that they still do Zoom calls, FedEx calls, uh, even if it's to somebody who's also in the office. So uh, they're not wanting people to come into conference rooms, and they're not wanting people to have uh, group meetings of five or more people particularly. Uh, but even two people in the conference room can create risk if they could sit at the other end of the conference room. But anything you can do to keep these people apart, even if they're at work, uh, would be a good thing to do. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of uh, our clients are doing these one-way uh one-way areas and signs and reminding people and wear your mask and wash your hands and all of those, and they're putting those all over the place just as reminders. Next slide. So a lot of our clients are having fewer in-person meetings, much um, more use of conference calls and video conferencing. 
not letting large gatherings and even large is, is five people is a lot. So just not letting people get together, not having social events. I mean, we canceled just about everything at Northern Lewis. We canceled our holiday parties. We canceled our partner meetings. We just canceled everything uh, because we don't want to do anything to encourage people to be gathering. So, uh, and, and, and so I would strongly recommend that you consider canceling any kind of event which has a number of people gathering together. Um, I don't know if the handshake is over forever and ever. I doubt it. I think it's very ingrained in, in who we are. Uh, I suspect that in 2021 or 2022, we will be shaking hands again. But right now, we are not shaking hands with anybody. So if you see people, and, and I still instinctively, when I meet someone, my hand goes out to shake it. And I just have to remember I'm not to do that anymore. So uh, I don't even like the shoulder bumping or whatever because you're just getting too close. So just don't let people, let people shake hands or have any physical contact. Um, and as I mentioned, elevators are going to be a problem, so you need to have a plan for that. Um, One-way hallways, um, so you go in this way and you go out that way. Uh, staggered meal schedules, so some people eat at 11 and some at 11.30 and some people at 12 and some at 12.30 and uh, we are encouraging people to bring meals from home. Uh, our tech clients are dealing with this issue because they've always provided three meals a day to their employees, and now their employees are working from home. Nobody's cooking them food all the time, so it's a funny issue for them. And then, of course, we want a plan of uh, what happens if somebody tests positive, what are you doing, what, who's going to do what, what kind of benefits are available, who's going to be reporting it. You just need to have a plan in place. Uh, so that it's not a panic of, what, well, if someone tested positive, what on earth do I do? Uh, you need to have that all determined before you start having people coming back. All right, disinfection, cleaning, and sanitizing. So these are the easier things to do, the more important things to do, but they can get expensive. So uh, I have one client that talks about the topia. What are they going to do with the copier? Obviously, everybody touches the copier. So, you know, what we were recommending is you put some sort of a, a plastic on top of the numbers, uh, and then you have a sanitizer right next to it so that people can bulk the copier after they use it. Not just that area, but all the areas of the copier that they touch. So, you just got to be thinking as you walk through the facility, what are people going to touch? Should it fill it? Up and on? Elevator key. Uh, what can we do to protect that and make sure that if the virus gets on it, the next person doesn't get it? And so a lot more cleaning of door knobs, light switches, countertops, handles, desks, phones, keyboards, faucets, toilet sinks. All of those things you've got to be thinking about. Are they going to be cleaned? Who's going to do the cleaning? So if once a day at the end of the day enough, do you need to bring somebody in in the middle of the day to clean? Uh, all of this is expensive. Um, but it's got to be something that you thought through. And then you want to have wipes and hand sanitizer all over the place so nobody has an excuse in the entryway when people come in and check in. There's got to be hand sanitizer there. Wipes on any surface that might need wiping. Um, wipeable covers on electronics, I mentioned. Encouraging hand washing, put up signs, provide soap, remind people about seeing Happy Birthday Twice or whatever their favorite song is. And then, you know, if people need gloves and gowns and things like that, uh, they should be provided. Uh, the DOH has guidance for cleaning and disinfection of public and private facilities for COVID-19. Look that up, uh, and that will give you some information on what you need to do to clean. And then you've got to have these hand sanitation stations with soaps and warm water. For buildings, this isn't going to be a problem, but for people who work outdoors or in warehouses or uh, the like, um, just going to have to remember to get the soap and the running in water and the paper towels and the hand sanitizer uh, so that people can stay clean. All right, we represent a lot of airlines, and I don't know what's going to happen to the airline industry. I know I just read that American Airlines is going to lay off another 19,000 employees. Uh, when the uh, money runs out. 
I just don't see people going back to business travel anytime soon. Uh, interestingly enough, I have some clients whose employees want to do business travel, partly because their competitors are doing it, are calling on customers, and they feel that they have a competitive disadvantage if they don't can't call on the customers and the competitors well. So we talk about, we advise our clients on what to do if employees really want to do business travel. Um, but if they don't, um, and you can avoid it, uh, I, and I think most people will be avoiding uh, business-related travel. Uh, a more tricky question is if they do personal travel. Can you tell people, tell you if they travel, uh, where they travel to? It's not illegal to do that, so you can certainly say, hey, if you decide to travel, and we were asking that about China and other countries when this pandemic started, had to travel to China, um, and that is not illegal to do that. If you want to do that, you can, and if you decide to, to quarantine people if they travel, I don't think anybody has COVID worse in the U.S. right now, so uh, other countries are banning our people, but I don't know how much we're banning other countries' people. Uh, but um, you certainly can ask that information if you want to know. Um, for all state-imposed travel requirements, like in New York and New Jersey, have, maybe some of the northeastern states are banning people, um, or taking them quarantine for 14 days. Hawaii, you have to quarantine for 14 days when you get there. So just watch those travel requirements and make sure you're in place for a quarantine so you're not sending people to places where they have quarantine. And of course, we've had many clients who have employees who are stuck in China, have been stuck in China since uh, March, before they went to the New Year's, and they cannot get back into the U.S. I have a client that called me yesterday. They have a husband in England and a wife in the U.S., and they've not been able to meet each other. So um, you know, this is causing a great hardship to a number of uh, companies and organizations, but they're the rules and we have to follow them. Uh, this issue about commuting and transportation is going to be a major problem for our clients who have employees in cities and who rely on public transportation. There are a lot of people who don't want to travel on public transportation, and uh, it's not your problem meaning not your legal problem, meaning you are not responsible to get your employees to work. They are responsible to get themselves to work. If they have to walk or scooter or take public transportation or buy a car, that is their responsibility, not yours. But it's yours from a morale standpoint, right? So if you've got employees who are not earning a lot of money and have to get to work, and the only way to do it is public transportation and they're scared, uh, you have to be mindful of how you're going to deal with that issue because Many people are scared of using public transportation. To the extent you can stagger their arriving times and their departure times so they're not uh, going at peak commuting times, that would be good too. Any questions on this topic? There's some related questions um, under the defense on. With respect to behavior in the workplace, obviously you can institute, you know, six foot distance rules and, and uh, other social distancing. Um, but what about concerns about uh, what employees are doing in their off time when they're not working or representing the employer, but maybe going to parties or you know, otherwise making bad choices? What I've seen employers do uh, for employees who are going to be coming to the office or otherwise, you know, interacting with coworkers or the public is to set expectations. You know, there we expect everyone to comply with the applicable stay at home orders and to otherwise exercise good judgment, et cetera. But I think given the um, you know prohibitions about relating off or the limitations I should say regarding relating off duty conduct, what you might be able to do about it can be somewhat limited. But I think you can use some common sense as to if you know, for example, Let's say someone, you know, posted publicly uh, themselves in a crowded party with a bunch of people not wearing masks. You know, I think that's something you can address with the employee. Well, have you seen that kind of off-duty, <laughs> uh, throwing caution to the wind, that safe behavior issue coming in, into play? Indeed. I've seen employees go to big parties on uh, Friday night and come in Monday morning, and Tuesday they infected themselves and a whole bunch of coworkers. And I don't know what you can do. Can you fire someone because they engaged in that? We do have a code section in California called 96K where you can't 
uh, terminate people for legal off-duty off-site conduct. Um, but if these people were not engaging in legal off-duty off-site conduct, you certainly can. Um, so you don't have to do that. So you think violation of the stay-at-home orders, if it yes. really is clear in your city or county, get you out of that section? Yep. At least enough to have a conversation. Yep, definitely so. So, um, and someone asked the question is, so for someone who's stuck in China since March, for example, um, and, you know, you know, can you terminate the person? I guess part of the question is whether they're able to do their job from there. Um, but if, they're, if, they're, if it's an in-person job and they would otherwise be coming into work, um, but they, you know, can't because they're, they can't get into the country, you can the employer terminate. I mean, we're all at will, right? Everybody in California and the United States is one of the great things about the U.S. is that uh, great in the sense that it's easy to fire people, which means it's easy to hire people. In countries where it's possible to fire people, it, many companies don't want to hire anybody because they can't fire them. Here, we're at will. It's relatively easy to hire and fire. So uh, you certainly can terminate someone if they can't do their job, uh, if they're not available to do their job. And um, most of our clients are following if they think that the person's going to be able to come back to work not too distant future. Uh, follow is like a termination in California. You have to pay out final paycheck. You have to pay all accrued vacation. So California treats a furlough, certainly an indefinite furlough, as a termination. You have to treat it as such, but you can keep people on benefits. They're not terminated. So you don't have to do the I-9 and all that stuff all over again when they come back to work. So they remain an employee. You can pay them if you want. You don't have to pay them. Keep them on benefits if you want. You don't have to. Cobra, but uh, that's what many of our clients have been trying to do. And then one other, one or one or two other pack up questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one with respect to um, testing. If you do have someone at the work site who's positive, um, do you then have to have everyone who is exposed tested? And I think the approach that employers have been taking is some have required that. I think you could require it. But um, but that I don't I don't think you have to. I agree. Uh, what people are doing in that circumstance. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't recommend it just because somebody was exposed to somebody who has COVID. Whether you mandate that all those people get tested, again, I don't think it's going to help you very much because it will only tell you if that on that day they have COVID, not if they get it the next day. So um, and and again, it's expensive and fairly invasive. So I would not recommend it just because somebody in contact with somebody. We've probably all been in contact with somebody who's tested positive, and if we haven't, we will be. So we just have to be fairly reasonable on this, in my view. And then one last tactic question, so something we've already covered, is on the supplies question. Um, some folks are finding that it's hard to get the supplies they need. I assume the hand sanitizer and the white. Um, I think a lot of channels have improved. I, you know, only because I seem to see that stuff everywhere where it, where it was hard to before. Um, I've also been told that on the CDC website, they will talk about different materials that can be used. So even if you can't find the wipes that you want or the particular hand sanitizer, there are other sort of chemicals and the like that you can use. But if you're really so short that you can't keep the workspace clean enough, then I think there's a question as to whether or not you really can open that workspace. I agree. Um, and then we've got some questions about liability and the like, but um, I'll raise those when we get to that section. Sounds great. Okay, next slide. All right, so this is back to the uh, whether we should be paying for face coverings, and I think the answer is uh, we recommend that you provide them. We recommend you pay for them. Uh, they're welcome to use their own face coverings. Um, there have been issues with what's written on face coverings. Um, there was a client who wanted to know whether the employee could, they could prevent the employees from wearing a Black Lives Matter, but more importantly, an All Lives Matter face covering. And that was, of course, very controversial. And the answer, in my view, is that you can prevent people from putting on their face coverings things that you don't want them to put on, just like you can prevent them from wearing clothing that has things you don't want to. It gets more awkward if you allow a black lives matter, but not an all lives matter. And this is always the problem is once you start allowing these things, then it becomes a slippery slope and you have to figure out um, where you're going to stop it. 
but uh, generally we do let people use their own face coverings and uh, you do have a right to tell them that their face covering is not appropriate workplace and that they should get another one or they should use yours. Uh, cloth based, disposable masks, both good. Uh, don't require N95s, those are for the healthcare providers. Uh, and we don't want private employers hogging that supply. But there are, obviously, for those of you who are in healthcare facilities, uh, like nursing homes and things like that, have to be super careful and provide all the PPE, have personal protective equipment that the um, OSHA requires for your facility. Don't let people share face coverings, provide training. So that's why I say you have to tell people, hey, you should throw your mask away here, don't let anybody use your mask, don't put your mask on the counter, wear it at all times. So just give some training on um, the requirements for the face mask, um, require it as employees and visitors, and uh, obviously volunteers. And then we mentioned about religion and disability. You have to accommodate that. So there are some people with breathing problems, they just can't wear masks. And if somebody has trouble breathing, then you cannot require them to wear a mask. And then you just have to decide if you can uh, accommodate that person by letting them do something different or work in a different place or be in a closed room. Uh, or if you can't accommodate them and it would be an undue hardship, then you have to make that decision. But that's the decision that's got to be made. You can. Okay, next slide. Teleworking um, is another very important area. Most of us have been teleworking for a long time. Uh, people were very tolerant of it for a while. And even when people start coming back to work, it's likely that they're going to continue to telework for a while. Uh, lots of things to think about teleworking. And the most important is reimbursable expenses. So as I mentioned, Labor Code 2802 requires that you pay for reasonable expenses incurred by your employee to do your, their job. And there was a case in California called Cochran v. Swan, which said that even if your employee incurred no incremental cost for a cell phone, meaning they had unlimited data, unlimited minutes, you still had to pay for a portion of the cost of the cell phone. They had to use it for work. And so this has now become a question on Internet access, and do you have to pay if your employees are working from home? Do you have to pay a portion of their Internet expenses if um, – even if there's no incremental cost to them, uh, if they're having to use the internet for work. And most of our clients are reimbursing both cell phones and internet or landlines if people still have such things, and internet expenses. Um, as I was mentioning before we started, we had a client um, yesterday who had an employee who wanted the employer to pay for air filters for their home. We've had a lot of smoke here in Northern California. The air is very uh, dangerous. Uh, and full of smoke, and so this client's employee said, uh, employer, I want you to pay for the cost of air filters. Uh, we did not think the employer had to pay for that cost. I'd like my employer to air condition my house because it's really hot last week, but I don't think that's going to be reasonable. But do think about these expenses. Other things to think about is ergonomic equipment. Uh, you know, I lived on a laptop on my sofa for two months, but now I can't do that anymore, and so I ended up buying a second monitor. I have a fancy chair, I have a pad, I have a mouse and a uh, keyboard, which I didn't, wasn't using before. Uh, should the employer be providing all those expenses? Uh, if they're reasonable and necessary, then under California law, you have to provide them. This was not an issue before COVID because we always said you know, employees were choosing to work from home, and therefore it was voluntary, and therefore you didn't have to pay. But now that it's not voluntary for people to work from home, they have to, we have to think about whether it's a reasonable, necessary expense. Another issue that I've been having a lot of questions about is where employees are working and tax ramifications. So your employee may say, look, I don't want to be in California anymore. I've decided to move to Montana or Wyoming or with my parents or Washington State or Australia or China or somewhere like that. And this creates a lot of tax issues. Um, you may, you as an organization, I know most of you are nonprofits, but you have to think about whether you have any tax issues, whether you're even authorized to do business in that location, because you can only do business in a place you're authorized to do business, and your employees are doing business in places you're not authorized to do business, that's a problem. 
uh, are you withholding income taxes at the California rate, at the Washington State rate, at the Australia rate? Are you paying into the social security system of Britain or China or Hong Kong? There are a lot of issues uh, if you have employees working uh, in other places. And some of the jurisdictions have uh, passed special rules for this uh, that say you don't have to be authorized to do business or you don't have to pay taxes. Uh, but that was before this was going to go on for as long as it is. And so I think the longer this goes on, uh, the more this is going to become a tax problem um, if your employees are doing business in other places. Uh, most of our clients are not allowing their employees to go to other countries to do business, particularly China and other places where uh, they're very nervous about their technology being taken, um, and they don't want the laptops in those countries. Uh, any clients are not letting people go to any other country because of the tax ramifications and the model price of the business there. And even if they go to other states, um, many clients are limiting it to put to avoid this problem. But, but please think about that issue of tax insiders, insiders, are you authorized to do business? And then there's all the normal stuff of, you know, you have a lower place where you have a lot of confidential information about your the people that you serve and they're on their laptops. They've got to make sure that that's kept confidential, that the children don't get access to it, that their houses don't get access to it, that their roommates don't get access to it. You've got to train your employees for keeping everything confidential, even though they're at home. Uh, we ideally like them to be in a private place where they are not going to get interrupted. They have to still keep their timesheets. They've got to take their meal breaks and their rest breaks. If they are non-exempt employees, uh, you've just got to make sure that people following all the rules, even though they're not in your presence, you can't make sure they're doing it. So um, it's good to have a teleworking policy, a teleworking agreement, a teleworking plan uh, for people so that they know what rules apply when they're working for them. I know. Well, probably, not, probably not a surprise, but we're getting lots of questions about the teleworking uh, issues given the you know, large bulk of the workforce who is uh, moved in-house, as I like to say, into their own house. Um, first, with respect to the expense issues, a lot of folks have said, how much, how much, how much, versions of that question. Um, and I will tell you that I will, uh, I'll do the short answer is we're not going to be able to give you a number. <laughs> and the reason we talk, by the way, is an antitrust violation. So our antitrust group told us you can't tell your clients how much to pay because then you're price fixing. You're basically telling people what to charge or what to pay, and that can be an antitrust violation. So they're super cautious, and they told us we can't tell you. I will tell you that what I'm recommending to clients is go on the Internet, find out what it costs to get Internet service in that jurisdiction, and then pay a reasonable, whatever you decide is reasonable, percentage of that. So um, and I can tell you know what I, I know what the clients are generally charging. I'm just not allowed from our analysts to tell you. I will say it does vary a bit. I mean, I think it depends on you know what uh, is really needed for that particular job, and you know how much someone is going to be using it. And so, uh, as Melinda said, people are you know looking at you know providers and saying, okay, how do how much does it cost for someone to get you know cell coverage? Um, you know, Wi-Fi, whatever, and coming up with, uh, you know, a reasonable estimate. Um, and it may also depend on, you know, if they're having to actually purchase equipment. Um, what we've seen in most cases is certainly true for us. Uh, yeah, I'm using all my office equipment in my home at the moment. Uh, so hopefully you can um, mitigate the need to actually purchase equipment. Um, but uh, but I don't know that there's a right answer. And frankly, even if more than I were, you know, free to go crazy and say the magic number is X, it's hard to come up with that magic number. You know, the best we could do is uh, a range. And I and I think, um, you know, looking at the elements of what someone really needs, I've seen employers, you know, uh, in order to reduce phone expenses and things like that, uh, put everything uh, through like the voice over internet internet communication. They require you know using Skype to their computer or whatever else it is. So I think you have to look at realistically what your folks are uh, using. So in a related issue, a lot of folks have asked, well, what about ergonomic issues? You know, a lot of people uh, have started out on their couch or their bed or whatever. Particularly, even people who had a home office. 
Um, that was for, you know, one person once in a while, not for, you know, two working spouses, a couple of college kids, a uh, high schooler, whatever, who's now needing a, a workspace. You know, do you, if, if you, someone had a stand-up desk at the office, you have to provide one in their house. You know, what do you have to do as far as uh, people's needs and what do you have to pay for? Right, and one of the problems our clients have is if you just give somebody $500 or a number, $1,000, and you say, this is for your home office and you don't require receipts, that's taxable income. You just give your employees money and that's wages, and it's, even if it's a one-time payment, and then you have to take taxes out of it. If you require, and you have to put it into the regular rate of pay for non-exempt employees. So that's not a good way to do it. But then you have to say, all right, well, you can go out and buy a monitor and submit the expense to us before we'll pay it. Or you can buy pens or yellow pads or whatever it is, and then you have to submit it to us. That's a real pain, too. But uh, at least it doesn't have the tax on the regular rate issues. And no, I don't think you have to prepare a stand-up desk. <laughs> So there's a few a few related question on, questions on ergonomics and and how much you should be sort of affirmatively asking those questions, right? And I can understand where that's coming from. You know, if you say to someone, "Are you okay? How are you doing without your standing desk?" You, know, you don't necessarily want to um, bring on it. I actually, you're right. I really do miss my standing desk. Um, but I have seen some employers uh, share best practices for creating an ergonomic workstation. There are a lot of things that you can do, like if your chair is the wrong height, you know, putting a little thing under your feet. Um, there's some, you know, generically available stuff out there that helps uh, people set up an ergonomic workstation. I think providing some education on that, um, you know, can be helpful. The problem is if you get an ergonomist, a lot of the ergonomists are going to companies and organizations and saying, hey, I'll do an ergonomic assessment for 40 bucks. And they do it, and then they come up with a recommendation, recommended list of 10 things that you need to buy for your employees so that they can have a ergonomic workstation and it ends up costing thousands of dollars. So beware of that. All right. Sure. And I think one, one catch-up question, uh, one catch-up question, Linda, relates to the um, state issue. Uh, the question is, should we have a policy stating that we can only consider employees who can work in, you know, these states because those are the only places where we're operated, to, where we're able to do business? Yep. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's not discrimination uh, based on national origin or race or anything like that. Many of our clients, by the way, are, are very happy and it's going to really help their diversity numbers, they're not going to be able to recruit, particularly our tech clients who are not going to require people ever to come back into the office, um, but they can recruit in other states that have higher minority populations, Mississippi, Alabama, places like that where they don't have offices, and they are now going to be able to recruit people in those states who they otherwise couldn't have recruited <laughs> when they required them to come to work. But, yes, you can require the people in the states in which you are doing business. <coughs> That's not a correct call. I think we're mostly caught up. Too much call. Yeah. Now every sneeze and cough has to come with us. Um, all right. So I think we're caught up on uh, questions except for a couple that we're going to address. Uh, where they come up in our slides. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll move on. And um, Wanda, I think I was going to take over from here for a little bit. Give you a Absolutely. break. Absolutely. Perfect time. Yes, to talk. I'm going to go get some more tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would teach her for being British if it wasn't uh, uh, harassment uh, and her teeth. So um, moving on to some high-risk employees, I think some of the questions that we got most frequently, particularly um, at the uh, start, but continuing now with respect to return to work, is, you know, what about our employees who are higher risk um, or at least appear to be in one of the higher risk categories, you know, uh, existing medical conditions, um, are more advanced in age, et cetera. And those are all valid concerns and they actually come into play with what happens. But, of course, as a, as a square one, you don't want to take it upon yourself to, uh, to self, you know, to identify those folks and um, and make assumptions, just like kind of the mindset that you would have with disability issues and age issues generally, 
uh, anytime you're starting from assumptions is a, is a bad place to start. So you don't want to um, assume whether older employees will come back to work. You don't want to assume what uh, conditions may affect people's decisions uh, because these could create issues under the discrimination statutes relating to age and, uh, and disabilities. And so as the slide notes, you know, allowing people to come to you with these issues, treating everyone the same is really the, the best place to start. Um, and many of these things, you know, may not, may not come up. So the better practice is to wait until they do and, and look at the full circumstances. Uh, moving on to the next slide. All right, so out in the field, we talked a little bit uh, already about, you know, some of the issues with uh, employees outside of just the, the four walls of the office or outside of their home. Um, but for some employees, the workplace is a, is a much broader landscape. And so when there's employees providing services that aren't just in the office setting, you want to look at, you know, how can that be done? Um, you know, if the job is largely, you know, taking meetings, interacting with people, uh, a lot of that can be done uh, remotely. Uh, certainly today is an example of how we've all gotten used to uh, meeting with each other and sharing information and having meetings via Zoom and WebEx and other platforms. You know, I will tell you from a litigator standpoint, you know, we thought mediation, for example, would never work virtually. Um, the whole magic of mediation was that people were, you know, stuck in a room all day and wanted to not make the day a waste and, you know, leave with a deal. Uh, well, Melinda and I both and, and our colleagues have had, you know, dozens and dozens of mediations all together between us. I know we've had several. And while each mediation sort of has its things that do and don't work, overall, it's worked surprisingly well. And so even though I, you know, the good old taking someone to lunch to talk to them about a topic or other in-person meetings, I don't think those will ever, you know, go the way of the dinosaur. But most things, even the things that you uh, you still have such an in-person value, can be done remotely. So it's worthwhile to do it that way. Um, obviously, the best guidance we have so far is that the virus spreads much less effectively in outdoor locations. So like most of you, I've seen, you know, nail salons with uh, stations that are outside and all sorts of things that would, would never have been done that way. Um, even schools who set out, uh, you know, tents and things to do uh, in-school learning but outside. And so if some things have to be in person, outdoors is always better than, um, than indoors. Uh, again, going back to the litigation context, we've had, uh, you know, I've seen some lawyers take in-person depositions. And they've chosen really big rooms with the tables far apart and, you know, good ventilation, you know, windows open when you can, all of those things. So even if things have to happen indoors, you can go by all the social distancing and cleaning and behavioral norms that we discussed earlier to make it um, as safe as possible. Uh, with respect to travel, uh, I agree with Melinda. I think travel, employee travel that we saw, you know, in January, February, and time past, I think it'll take a long time before that returns. Um, even done as safely as possible, there certainly increased risks to travel. Uh, and not to mention the expense. You know, one of the ways that companies are coping with the, you know, revenue and, and profit hits, you know, even for you all, not for profit, not for profit, you still need uh, money to function. And so the, one of the ways to deal with those hits is to reduce expenses. So reducing travel certainly helps there. Um, but all travel is not stated equally. And if you can avoid public transportation, for example, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, use things like masks and hand sanitizers and things to uh, best guard employees who are traveling, that's the kind of expectation that you, uh, that you want to set. And, and using car services like Uber and the like, some of you have been watching the news, see that there, was a, uh, there, there was a a brief threat as to whether or not uh, the ride shares would be completely stopped in California for a while. We seem to have gotten past that hurdle. Um, so at least those are an option for folks who don't have their own vehicles, at least for now. Again, the same issues for in-person, you know, provide the right masks and the like, the PPE, 
the sanitizers and and just train people. You know, it's hard to know how much people have, uh, you know, turned a blind eye to some of the guidance that we think we all know. And so as the importer, you know, reminding people, and the CDC has all sorts of fact sheets and the like that you can provide, um, that can be helpful. And if employees do need to be out and about um, or do things outside of the office or their home, um, it's good to keep a log of the where's and the when's and the who's so that um, you can take the right measures if that employee gets sick or, or there's any uh, issue with the you know, contact tracing or the like. So if you do need someone out and about, it's good to limit it and keep track of where the person was. All right, next slide. All right, so I think, Melinda, you were going to take us over here, and uh, we don't have any questions sort of yet at this juncture, but we'll continue to handle them as we happen. So one of the questions we've been getting a lot of is, am I going to be sued by somebody for COVID exposure? And I talked to a client yesterday, and they told me they just renewed their insurance policy for employees, the ELI policy, and it excludes COVID claims. So obviously the insurance companies are worried about it, too and they're excluding coverage for such claims. Um, we actually don't think that it's going to be a big risk for you, at least with respect to your employees. First of all, they're going to have a hard time showing that they contracted COVID at work, given that it's all around our society right now. Uh, and secondly, even if they did, we believe this is covered by workers' compensation. And workers' compensation is good because for the, for the employee, because they don't have to show that the employer did anything wrong, they just get the money if it was work-related. Um, uh, it may raise your, your workers' compensation costs, but uh, there's not a lot of money that's paid out in workers' compensation. So workers' compensation covers any illness, injury, sickness, damages that an employee suffers at work as a result of work, and if the employee claims they got COVID from work, that should be covered by workers' compensation. What won't be covered is if an employee's spouse or children or elderly parents catch COVID from the employee and the employee got it from work because workers' compensation only protects you from lawsuits by employees, not from relatives of employees. Uh, but again, we think the risk of liability is really low, um, <clears throat> except in the healthcare field, there weren't any cases that allowed liability for employers for sicknesses caused by relatives of employees who got the sickness from work. So we just don't think that this is going to be a huge issue going forward. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it, which doesn't mean you shouldn't do all the things we've been telling you about protecting your employees. Um, but I'm not a big, I don't have a big concern about the litigation. Next slide. Um, we've been looking at the types of uh, claims that are, are being filed, and uh, we actually did a survey of all the litigation that was filed that had the word pandemic or COVID in it that involved employment claims. And we looked at it throughout the country. Guess which state has the most claims by employees by far uh, relating to COVID? Who did not say California? Well, since everyone else is <laughs> <I won't> say <laughs> California. <laughs> Yeah, we found, uh, we looked at all this litigation, and uh, California uh, had 84 at the time we did the study, which was the highest, of course. And now, we do have 10% of the population of the U.S., so it's not surprising, but we had a disproportionate number of these cases, followed by Florida, New Jersey, and New York. So for those were the big four. Florida had 54, New Jersey had 50, New York had 41. And then we looked at the types of complaints that people are making. And the most common type of complaint that people are filing is that they were retaliated against for complaining about workplace conditions. So they were, they complained that the place wasn't safe for work, that people weren't wearing masks, that the, all of the complaints about the workplace not being safe, and then a bad thing happened to them. They were fired, they were furloughed, uh, they were, the hours were cut. So they were retaliated against. Of all the lawsuits we looked at, 155 of them had that claim in it. And then the were next most common, 126, was wrongful termination claims. And so these were claims where people said they were fired or 
uh, some illegal reasons. Um, often discrimination, they were, they were discriminated against, and COVID was used as an excuse. The most common types of claims I saw were the employer said they were laying people off because of COVID, but they picked me because of my age or my gender or my national origin or something else. And then there were a lot of claims on leaves of absence, people who were denied leaves of absence, people who were given leaves of absence, and then fired after taking a leave of absence. Uh, of the industries that were most infected, the healthcare industry had the most number of claims, um, and I think there were 105 of them against the healthcare industry. So that's sort of a summary of the claims, but the, the slide talks about OSHA whistleblower claims. So people have a right to go to OSHA or Cal OSHA, as we have here, and say, my workplace is safe, and then you cannot retaliate against someone who does that. So if you do retaliate against someone who, who goes to OSHA or Cal OSHA and complains, then that is uh, illegal, and you can be sued for retaliation for complaining. So my advice is if somebody complains about unsafe conditions or inadequate precautions or anything, take their complaint very seriously, investigate it, uh, and make sure nothing bad happens to that person thereafter who made a claim, even if the claim turns out to be a fake claim or a false claim or an unsubstantiated complaint. As long as it was made in good faith, then you cannot retaliate against the person. Just like someone complains of sexual harassment or race discrimination or anything like that, once they make a claim, they have a super protection, and it's much riskier to uh, lay off, terminate, cut hours, do anything negative, get a bad performance review for somebody who has made a complaint. That's Next slide. So we've looked at other types of claims. Um, again, litigation that the company didn't comply with the law on safe workplaces. So this, you know, this is so important to follow the laws and watch for the laws because if you don't follow a law, then you're going to have a problem. We've seen nuisance claims. I don't know if you saw them against uh, McDonald's and some of the other. Um, fast food restaurants where they, somebody sued and said, your building is a nuisance, meaning it's, uh, it's making other people sick, making people sick, and you should close it down. So we've seen those types of claims. We talked about workers' compensation claims, tort claims. Uh, we've seen a lot of claims on failure to accommodate, so somebody wants an accommodation. One of the questions that I'm asking myself is, is fear of coronavirus and disability. So if somebody says, I don't want to come to work because I'm scared I'm going to get sick, is that a disability? I actually don't think it is, but it wouldn't surprise me if people make that claim. I mean, some, some fears are phobias, and phobias are certainly disabilities, but whether a um, regular fear of getting sick is, is a disability remains to be decided. Uh, and then we'll see what you have to do to accommodate have to provide private transportation instead of making people take public transit. Uh, you know, how do you have to let people take time off work? Do you have to uh, adjust your workplace? What do you have to do as a business accommodation? We're expecting a lot of wage and hour claims. The advice expenses we've talked about, people didn't get overtime, didn't get their meal breaks or their rest breaks. Uh, people should get if they're doing screenings, you're doing medical screenings or other types of screenings or temperature checks, you should be paying them for the time that they're waiting in line, get the temperature checked, uh, and uh, claims where people's wages are refused as a result of this. Again, they have to show that there's some legal reason, because generally you can reduce people's pay. Some states you have to give notice before you do that, but generally you can. And then lots of claims under the federal state leave laws, making sure that people comply with all including the FFCRA, the federal law, it gives people 10 days of paid sick leave if you have fewer than 500 employees, and then 10 weeks of um, sick leave or, or leave if you need it to care for your children. That's cool. Next slide. Uh, like, hopefully not, nobody on this list has to deal with labor unions, and I say hopefully because um, they can be difficult to deal with. Uh, unions are fighting for their lives in many industries right now and are using COVID as an opportunity to um, fight hard for the, work, uh, the rights of workers uh, and uh, creating problems for employers in doing that. Uh, so uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of unfair labor practice claims and other types of claims by unionized employees. 
um, people who get laid off are suing. Uh, again, I mentioned that if you do a layoff in California, you have to give the final paycheck on the day of the layoff, and companies don't know that, and they're not doing it. Uh, they're not getting COBRA notices correctly or timely. Um, if you have a WARN Act where you close a facility uh, or you lay off enough people, you have to give 60 days notice and you have to pay people for 60 days. There was an exception made during the pandemic, so you don't have to give 60 days notice, but you have to give as much notice as you can. And the question is whether employers are complying with that. We talked about invasion of privacy claims, uh, that people's medical information or other information get disclosed to family members or others during the pandemic. And then the usual and the most common discrimination and retaliation claim uh, by people saying you picked them for a salary reduction or a layoff or a furlough or something because of a protected character. Next slide. I think this was the last slide. Waivers. Oh, that's right. So a lot of clients are saying to us, all right, well, I'm just going to have my employee come back to work, but I want them to waive their right to sue me if they get COVID. And the answer is no. We don't recommend that. Um, first of all, because workers comp you want people to have the right to go to workers' compensation, and uh, you can't waive your right to go to workers' compensation. So if somebody has a claim for workers' compensation, they cannot release that right. Uh, before they filed their claim and settled it. So uh, you wouldn't want people to release that right, and you couldn't have them release that right. Uh, so there'd be all sorts of questions about whether your waiver covered that. Um, also, we think that if you are asking people to waive their right to sue you, it means you don't think your workplace is safe, and therefore that will add uh, the ability of people who sue you to say, hey, you brought this person into work and you knew it wasn't safe. And how do I know that? Because you asked them to sign a waiver. That shows that you knew it was unsafe. So we recommend that you don't do that. And also for morale reasons. You're asking people to waive their right to sue you, which we don't think they have a right to sue you anyway. But if you're asking them to waive, that suggests that you don't think the workplace is safe, and that can create morale issues as well. And then are you really going to fire people who don't say to sign the waiver? I don't think so. <laughs> so, our best practice, if you really want people to sign something, and I don't think you should, but if you really want them, you can have them to sign an acknowledgement that says, I acknowledge that you know, there are risks of uh, COVID, uh, catching COVID at work, and I agree to follow all the policies, and I understand I must wear my mask, and all of these things. So, it's more like an acknowledgement and a commitment to follow the rules rather than a waiver of the right to you may also have visitors and, and, and also your volunteers and, and the people you serve, you may want to have them sign these acknowledgements, uh, as I'm calling them, uh, that they'll follow the rules and then know the risk. And next slide, if there is one. Yep, oh, that's it. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, as long as we look at uh, the Morgan Lewis Global Reach, uh, we can uh, check up on a few questions that were in the chat. Um, one of them going back to the testing issue. I know we talked about um, paying for the test, but what about for the time? So if the employer is going to require the test, so the COVID test, whichever one it may be, uh, do they need to pay for that testing time? So first of all, I think the easier issue is if you have them, if you're requiring them to take their temperature or do take their temperature or they have to wait in line to have their temperature taken or they have to wait in line to fill out your survey, you probably have to pay for that. You may have heard of the bag check cases where employees who work in retail stores, particularly electronic stores, have to have their bags checked before they leave for the lunch break and before they leave at the end of the day by a supervisor who has to check they haven't stolen a lot of the equipment put it in their bag. And those retailers all got food, and um, many of them have, at least in California, been held liable for, or could be held liable for uh, the time that the employee spends waiting to have that bag check. And based on those bag check cases, I think that if you have employees waiting in line to get a test or to have like a temperature check or whatever else, you be paying them for that time. Whether you want to estimate that time and add it to that time sheet. And again, I'm talking about non-exempt employees. Yeah. Exempt employees, you can do what you want. 
non-exempt employees, uh, you should be adding time, whether it's – even if you have them take the temperature at home, so that takes time. So maybe you should have them add five minutes or ten minutes, whatever you think it's going to take for them to do that testing and um, pay them for that time. And same for if you're requiring them to actually take the COVID test? So I think that's a little harder, but again, if it's – uh, required to do the job, then uh, I think you would be much safer off paying for the time as well as the test if it is required. Rather than having to deal with a lawsuit um, if you turn out to be wrong. That's what I've seen as well. And it can be difficult because that can be a fairly big chunk of time, depending on how the employee is going about taking the test. So if it is something that you're going to have a lot of employees doing, uh, having some intel yourself on, local, you know, where you're in your locality, what the easiest and sort of most efficient way to get a test is uh, can help because uh, it's not always easy for folks to figure out uh, where they can get it, uh, whether they can make an appointment, all of those things, so it doesn't turn into, you know, a 12-hour uh, test. Uh, we have another question about um, hazard pay. Uh, there's a, uh, someone said they're an essential, serve, essential business, so have been in, uh, you've been in practice continuing uh, all along, and if uh, employees have asked about um, hazard pay, which I put in quotes first. <laughs> so we, we, we do not like to that. use the word hazard pay. That's, that has, sends the wrong message to your employees. We are paying you for the hazard of coming to work during a pandemic. So you can call it a premium or a supplement or whatever. Uh, and employees are generally liking that. At some point, it's going to end, and they may be unhappy when it ends. Uh, again, as long as you pay it based on the hours they work and not at that rate, you don't have to deal with regular rate issues for the non-exempt employees. And if you're looking at communications, you know, you can look online at what some of the, you know, big high-profile Companies have done, a lot of retailers uh, have added, you know, $2 an hour, things like that. Look at, you know, Target, Amazon, look at those type of, and you can just see how they've, because um, everything they do is very public, see how they phrase it, see what you do and don't like about that, see how things were, were received well or not well in the media. That can be some help there if you're looking at that issue. Um, so I know we're running out of time. A couple of other things. Uh, if you do have a, um, a group of folks who are in a, um, you know, older, uh, sort of older age group, uh, the question we had is, uh, on the chat was employees over 65 feeling like they don't trust that their younger coworkers are actually acting safely outside of work, and what if they want to stay home? Um, you know, I think requests to stay home, um, you've, you've got to, you have to have some sort of consistency and uniformity, especially if you're going to say no to some people and yes to others. So, um, but in that good reason category might be folks who are able to identify a, a vulnerability, um, like their perception of their age, again, it shouldn't be your judgment, um, their perception of whether they're at a, in an age group that um, that is more vulnerable, and certainly there are CDC statements about this as well, so 65 might be a good cutoff, or for other um, ailments, but I think you just you have to, you know, look at each situation and make sure if you're going to say yes to no and no, yes to some and no to others. Uh, that you're being consistent. And if some jobs really absolutely cannot be done remotely, uh, then you have to consider other options like uh, leave or a change of job or, or the like. Um, let's see. Uh, and a few folks have asked about a sample safety policy. I'm not sure if that refers to the various protocols about hand washing and things like that. Um, one, I don't know if we have one that we distribute or if you've, if, uh, if you've seen that there's one on the – CDC or other uh, OSHA website? Somebody told me that Tesla has an excellent playbook on return to work. So you can – I haven't looked at it yet. But uh, we can certainly send you policies if you want. Um, just need to understand exactly what it is you're looking for. But we have done a lot of return to work policies okay. and, you know, what the company should do. But then most of the local ordinances have their own rules. And they have the writings that you have to give to the employees and the checklist you have to provide and the things you have to post. So I would look at the local ordinance. And, uh, and if you don't have one in your community, then look at the Panasara County local ordinance. They have a lot of rules on what you have to provide to employees. And then someone asked, should we develop a policy or process for bringing people back to the office? And should it include a form 
uh, for those apps to continue remote to be implemented. And I think having some uh, policy or process is always a yes, right, because you want to have um, you want to be clear about expectations and requirements and you want to have consistency. You know, again, you don't want people, you know, again, we don't, you don't want to be in waiver territory, but having people understand the, the basic expectations and um, and how those may be subject to change, right, as until uh, the uh, pandemic changes uh, from the scientists and the health experts. Uh, let's see. Someone um, raised a question about HIPAA and self-disclosures. Um, you know, all the same rules apply. Uh, Melinda mentioned, for example, if you get medical information like test results from someone, even if it's a temperature test result, those need to be treated like medical records, you know, kept separate from regular personnel documents, you know, not available to decision makers that don't have any need to know this health information. And to the extent you have information about others, Say you are, you know, a health organization yourself. All of the same uh, HIPAA, HIPAA rules uh, would apply. And by the way, you shouldn't be keeping the self information. If you test people's temperatures and they pass, just no reason to retain that information. Just don't keep it. Yeah. And if you want to memorialize that you did it, you can memorialize that you did it. You know, that you know, we conducted temperature checks of everyone who entered our, our building or whatever. You don't need to have, you know, Melinda. 99.1, <laughs> Jennifer 98.7. All right, guys, I think that um, we're right at the end of our time. I think we've caught all of the questions. Um, so uh, I, I think we can do the wrap-up. Yes, well, thank you so much, Melinda and Jennifer. So, such valuable information. I think everyone thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you. And, um, I, a lot of people have asked for the presentation, so for all the attendees that have attended, I'll, I could send over the uh, sample PowerPoint version or PowerPoint. And I did record this, and I'm just, I just need to figure out how to save it, and um, if I can somehow send it over as well, uh, we'll, we'll figure that out as well. Um, but thank you again, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much to everybody and to Hayana and Morgan Lewis and Camilo as well. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.